everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Polly Courtney. Polly is the author of six novels, including It's a Man's World. She is also a media commentator, appearing on UK TV and in well-known magazines and newspapers. So welcome, Polly. Hello, hi. <laughs> it's great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. Oh no. So first up, why don't you tell us a bit more about you and your writing and publishing background? Sure. Um, right, where do I start? Um, I'll go right back to the beginning. Um, I actually never intended to be a writer. Um, way back when I was little, I wasn't one of those people who um, had always wanted to write since the age of five. And I went into sciences and did an engineering degree and went into the city like a lot of engineers do. And I thought, this is going to be it. This is my career. I'm going to make lots of money and be a completely you know, high flyer in the city, just like, um, like they told us we could be on the milk round. Um, and I went into the city and quickly learned that it actually wasn't all it was cracked up to be in any way, um, to the extent that I left um, and wrote a book about it. Um, and that book went on to become my first novel, Golden Handcuffs. Um, but I took an unusual route to publishing it. First, this was back in um, 2003 or four, and at that time, um, the route, the only route really um, to publishing was um, to get yourself an agent and to get that agent to get you a traditional publisher. And mm. um, so that's what I did, and I was in a good position where I had um, multiple options for an agent. I, um, I went along with one that I thought was the most commercial and sensible for me, and um, I watched as she touted it with the publishers and the publishers started coming back with comments and they were comments that all rang along the same lines which was basically um, we really like your style and we think it's you know we like the way you write but why on earth are you writing about the city who would want to know about that <laughs> and, and I got comments like you know can we cut all the office scenes or can we change the office scenes to scenes where she's splashing her money around that she's earned in the city, you know, buying <laughs> handbags and lipstick and, and that. So I was literally, um, this, this was the sort of response I was getting. And I did take this on board and thought, well, do I want to write chick lit about buying handbags? And the answer was no. I really wanted to get this story out there. That was the mm. whole point in my, you know, that's, that was the story I wanted. So um, what I ended up doing was um, publishing it myself. And that was in 2006. Um, and I felt there was such there was definitely a story there that needed mm. to be telling. Um, if the traditional publishers weren't willing to take it off, then I'd do it myself. And it turned out um, people did want to read about the city, and I sold um, the first print run, which was ten thousand copies within the first um, three months or so, um, and managed to get a whole load of press coverage. And um, yeah, to cut a long story short, um, I ended up going down the self-publishing route. Um, and my success in self-publishing mm. actually got me a deal um, with HarperCollins. So then I transitioned into traditional publishing. Wow. And it, I mean, that's quite a story back then, you know, in the mid 2000s. You know, one day we'll look back and we're like, wow, the dark ages, no e-books, no... Kindle. Yeah, it really was like that. There were no e-books. And was you shifted print books. That's, I mean, that's amazing. And then you got this traditional deal. But let's, you know, fast forward. So you, so, so everyone was thinking, wow, the pinnacle of your success. And then I first heard of you last year when um, this girl gets on the TV and, and dumps her publisher because they're trying to put her in some chick lip box and and that was you so t tell us a bit more about that story yes um and we always have to bear in mind that the press will say um a story with a strap line and there's always more to it underneath <laughs> um so it's really nice to have the opportunity to tell you what what lies underneath um what happened um once i took on my publishing deal with harper collins was that I very quickly realised um, that I might have made a mistake in that um, this wasn't the right publishing deal for me, the right imprint of the, the of a publisher. Mm. Um, and they were very um, commercial, is probably one way of describing them. Um, and what they liked to do, um, I discovered, was to package up books um, in the form of whatever the latest trend that was, you know, that, that was um, running through the publishing industry was. So um, my first book ended up being packaged in a way that was very, it was sort of straight for the Richard and Judy um, book list, which is great mm -hmm. if my book had been, um, if the contents of the book had matched what was 
um, what it had ended up being packaged as. Um, so with my first book, I thought, well, they're the experts. They know what they're doing. So um, absolutely, I'll let this one, I'll, I'll let them, them go their way. Um, and the second book um, came out around the time when X Factor was really quite big. Mm. And um, I wish I could show you a copy here, but look it up. Um, the Fame Factor was what it ended up being called. Not my choice. Yeah. Um, I didn't have say over title or cover design, and that was that was really the point, I suppose. Um, so the fame factor came out with all blue swirls and silver stars all over it, and um, and I thought, oh, wow, this is really not representative of what's inside because, ironically, the um, the story was about a young um, musician who signed with a big label and discovered um, that she didn't have so much say and that it wasn't all it was cracked up to be. <laughs> so um, <laughs> read in that what you will. Um, but the publishers decided that X Factor was the way forward for that one and I was really unconvinced um, and thought about sort of walking out then um, but then realised that I, I really did want to write this third book that I had in my mind which was all about um, lads mags and the way they were influencing our society. Um, so I wrote the third book um, about Lads Mags and um, lo and behold it came out looking like pure, pure chiclet, which I really didn't believe it was. Um, and by this point, um, after three books, I just thought, I've really had enough. Um, but rather bizarrely, there were conversations going on about, you know, oh, so um, w when we're working together and as though um, there was no problem. But for me, there was a bit of a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I walked out on Harper Collins, and it may have seemed to people reading the press um, that I was throwing a hissy fit at something that was really not that important, but really what it represented was um, my fury, if you like, at the mis mismarketing, really, which is what it was. It was sort of packaging something as, as, as something that it wasn't, um, and just I thought sort of fooling um, the readers, you know, you, you're selling chalk as cheese and so you're just disappointing everyone. That was that was really the main point, although of course um, the press took up various um, different angles and I suppose because they'd used the angle of sexism that I walked away from in the city, they, they, they continued that theme and talked about the kind of male-female thing and the um, my objection to the soft, fluffy, girly um, chiclet, mm. um, which is fine, it, it's sort of, um, that was definitely one 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 part of the issue so mm. yeah that that was the full story um but of course the headlines sound better, better. yeah <laughs> no that that is fantastic and it brings up a really good point which is you know with self-publishing you do and we, you know we call it kind of indie publishing now independent do, you make all the decisions and you act as a business person yeah. and um, from looking at you and your career now I mean you are a businesswoman you, you, I mean, you went into business and you, you now act as a businesswoman for your career you're a speaker you do media you do all this stuff um, so how, how do you feel now and how does the issue of control come into your publishing decisions are you pure indie are you hybrid what are you now um, it's a really good question, and you're totally right that I do see myself as, as more of a business person than anyone else, um, with a creative streak, obviously. But yeah, what I do is um, is, is sort of control the process, and um, I suppose I do see myself as more of a director of um, the various elements of the, the publishing industry that I'm in, um, rather than actually the doer of, and there is a difference, because I think a lot of mm. people think self-publishing is about doing it all yourself, but actually I should you should never design a cover if you're not a cover designer and that, <laughs> etc. Um, but yeah, so I do see myself there, and um, in terms of whether I'm um, pure self-publishing, I think I'm going that way actually. Um, mm -hmm. I still do have books out, obviously, under the HarperCollins imprint, yeah. um, and um, because they're actually still in print, um, their rights are with them, and the, so I can't do anything about the cover design at the moment mm. because they're all so recent. Um, my plan is um, to buy back the rights um, okay. when they go out of print. So. Um, yeah, I think I'm definitely going down the pure self-publishing route, but I do acknowledge that actually at this point in time it's not right for everyone, and I'm certainly not advocating everybody um, just does it themselves. Um, 
so I'm also I'm also interested in um, you know sort of going back to your story. You mentioned the milk round, and some people might not know what that is. And I was at Oxford. You were at Oxford, right? Oh, Cambridge. Cambridge. Blah, boo. <laughs> Wouldn't hold that against <laughs> boo, you. Boo here. Yes. Um, but for people who don't know, the milk round is when you know big companies come to universities like Oxford and Cambridge, and we go and we meet them, and then we go get a job in the city. And I did the same as you, and you know, and I I've got this thing about Britain where um, I had to, I think I had to be in Australia to sell published because of the the literary snobbery that exists in this country and particularly when you come out of Oxford and Cambridge and you go to the city that snobbery seems even worse so I, I want to know how did you break through that feeling and self-publish back then yeah um you're so right about the snobbery and it's not just literary <laughs> um this country does have an issue um but um I do remember um, being told when I'd first published my book, and obviously I'd published it myself, um, being told by lots of people, oh, you've done very well to get a publishing job. Oh, it's very hard to publish a book, isn't it? Very hard. Um, and nobody thought to even look at who had published it. And if they'd looked carefully, they would have seen that it was self-published. I, at the time, didn't shout about it because the self-publishing and vanity publishing were almost synonymous and there, it was basically that snobbery you talked about um, so I didn't shout about it I'm very happy to shout about it now because actually people are waking up to the fact that it is a proactive choice you can make but back then it was definitely seen as a last resort um, but in internally um, having to come to terms with that kind of um, feeling that I was doing doing something going against the grain I suppose um, I just basically felt really strongly that there was this this um, market for the book that I was writing I had that conviction um, and I had to just believe that the publishers had made the wrong decision which is quite an arrogant thing to say um, but I think sometimes the filters that they put on particularly now with the market changing and the publishers losing so much power to the retailers and feeling so kind of terrified of making a mistake I think the filters that they apply are sometimes maybe not wrong, but maybe they're just, um, you know, they will only want to sell a book if they can guarantee it will sell some copies, whereas I would take that risk. So it was a risk thing, but yeah, it paid off. No, that, well, let's call it confidence and not arrogance, because I, I get that, you know, and from you, uh, you know, you on TV as well, I think that confidence is really important, but a lot of authors feel, you know, the pressure, then they're not confident. So have you got any tips for kind of, is, is it fake it till you make it? Is that what you did? Um, do you know, I think the way I did it, um, it's hard to sort of look back and analyse, but I think the way I do it generally is to try and involve as many people as I can along the way on the journey because mm. people often say to me, oh, writing can be very isolating. And those are the same people who also think that, you know, they have no confidence if they're writing. And actually, mm. I think it doesn't have to be isolating. I think if you, if you get people involved, and people who want to be involved, obviously, um, but you'd be surprised how many friends and family and, and people, you know, do actually want to get involved. And I'm talking about, you know, they want to help with the editing or particularly with the promoting. Um, they, they'll be involved and that will give you confidence because you realise that they've read the book and that they actually enjoyed it and there is a market out there for it and you haven't just written it for yourself, you've written it for people who are going to enjoy those words on the page. So I think people is the key, collaborating. Mm. But last question before I let you go. Yeah, we've mentioned The Guardian a few times and for the Americans listening, you know, The Guardian is, I think it's, it's kind of a highbrow newspaper, you know, quality quality yeah, newspaper and website and um, again when we talked about snobbery I would say The Guardian is up there and there's been a, a quite a bit of anti self-publishing stuff written by uh, a few journalists who we won't name um, but you've just you've been doing or you are in the middle of doing some uh, breakfasts for The Guardian um, on self-publishing and I'm yeah. like I'm kind of gobsmacked so do you think this shows a change in attitude do you think it's self-publishing is the new in thing in Britain I think people are quite confused about where the market's going and the way that they still are a bit confused about the music industry and is it going online or offline and is it going traditional or is it fragmenting into everyone self doing it themselves um, and because there's this transition there's whatever's going to happen there's definitely a transition underway and um, that's creating kind of 
banter between the people who feel strongly either way mm. um, and I think that, that we can all use that to our advantage if we if we really feel strongly that self-publishing is the way forward then we can try and prove that and that's I guess what I'm doing um, with the Guardian Masterclass is just saying how you can do it successfully because let's face it with everyone trying to self-publish that means it's even harder to kind of rise above it and stick your head up um, mm. and one of the ways you can do that is to effectively replicate um, what the traditional publishers have done in the past but do it better in a lot of ways um, mm. and promotion is one of those ways. Mm. Fantastic so where can people find you and your books online? Um, Amazon um, and I guess um, my web page and Facebook and Twitter and YouTube um, I guess Google me <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and just hopefully, your... hopefully the right things will come up <laughs> and just tell us your URL um, it's www.pollycourtney.com fantastic well thanks ever so much for your Thank time you. Polly that was great thanks nice speaking to you